Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Thyroid Fixer Podcast. You guys have been hearing me talk about this for a while now. You've heard me send you to Dr. Lindsay Berkson's books, her podcast, her website, right? But now I have her here. Yay! So this is a long-awaited interview. I am so excited. I, I Honestly, I think it's going to be one of the best interviews I've ever done. But the information that we're going to give you today is just, it's just mind blowing. And it's something that every single woman needs to hear. And you need to hear it over and over again. And you need to get it in your head because we need to break the myths and the fears that hormone replacement, specifically estrogen, but let's just talk hormone replacement in general is bad for you, will cause breast cancer. I want to talk about the Women's Health Initiative study. The more I looked in, we're going to talk about this, Dr. Berkson. The more I looked into this, this is one of the most expensive, worst done studies ever. So this is going to be a game changer for you. And you can probably hear the excitement in my voice. The latest introduction, the latest member of the family to the fixer line is metabolism fixer. And this, oh my God, I formulated this just for all my people out there that need to lose weight, that need help in the weight loss department, that can't lose weight no matter what they do, that feel like they have a slow metabolism. And that might be thinking of trying all those peptides out there, you know, the Beverly Hills soccer mom drug of choice for weight loss peptides. Or even if you're on them already and you're like, man, these are really expensive and I'm still not losing weight, add in Metabolism Fixer. Here's what I did. I took the power of T2, which increases your basal metabolic rate while you are sitting there watching Netflix. You're burning fat while you're watching Netflix. I combined it with a very unique patented ingredient called Suppressa. Suppressa has multiple clinical trials backing its efficacy in reducing your appetite, decreasing snacking, and providing way more control over your food intake. It is amazing. We also see improved emotional well-being, just decreased food cravings all around, reduced hunger, and weight management. Add on top of that, we have green tea extract, we have purple forest purple tea extract, both of which affect the metabolism in a very positive way without the jitters of normal fat burning supplements out there from the 1980s and 90s, right? The ones that made you feel like you're having a heart attack. You will not have that in any of my supplements, thyroid fixer or metabolism fixer. But metabolism fixer, oh yeah, we kicked it up a notch. It is in powder form. So you can drink it through your day. It's going to flavor your water. We got orange crush and refreshing citrus. I love them both. It is going to keep you under control all day long. So you throw a couple scoops in your water bottle in the morning, throw a scoop or two in your water bottle throughout the day. You will have fat burning and appetite control the entire day for what? An eighth of a price of the peptides? Oh my God, you can't go wrong. So grab some Metabolism Fixer today. Please let me know how you do on it. I am super excited for you. Super excited. So let me tell you about Dr. Lindsay in case you guys don't know, or many of you do, because many of you have heard me talk about her forever now. Her, her knowledge base, just it just blows me away. So Dr. Berkson has been called a thought leader in functional medicine, and that's an understatement as she's been teaching, relicensing educational seminars for physicians for four decades. We're talking MDs, NDs, DCs, pharmacists, NPs. She's taught us all. She's taught us all. She has a very unique background. Dr. Berkson started out in chiropractic and naturopathic medicine. She published one of the first breakthrough books on endocrine disruption. We always talk about that on here. Hormone Deception and was then invited to be a hormone scholar at a world-renowned estrogen think tank at Tulane University, the Center for Bioenvironmental Research. Here, she worked with the scientists who discovered the first estrogen receptors and focused on receptor functionality. Dr. Berkson formulated the first female nutraceutical line for physicians in the U.S., Metagenics Fem line, and has launched a new hormonal line for biotics this year, which I heard her talk about. It's very interesting. 
She and Dr. J.V. Wright hold a patent on bioidentical hormones, and she holds another collaborative patent on a drug for dialysis and diabetic patients. She has collaborated and published research on dialysis and nitric oxide with the University of Texas Medical School at Houston. She's authored 21 books, many of them on hormones, such as Safe Hormones, Smart Women. She also hosts or hosted Dr. Berkson's Best Health Radio Show, which is still out, and that's where I tell you all to go. So I'm hoping that she's going to come back to us in one form or another in a podcast <laughs> for one of these days. But Dr. Berkson, thank you so much for being on here. I'm just, I'm just blessed. I am just blessed to have you. Thank you so much for having me. I can't say how excited I am to reach people. And that was such a lovely and heartfelt introduction. So I, I'm glad to hang out with you at the same time. I'm glad to share all this critical information with people out in your listening audience. Thank you. And it's such, it's such needed information. So we have to start with your story. I've heard it. You're, you're a DES daughter, breast cancer survivor, proponent of the use of hormones for preventing breast cancer. So please, let's start with your story. When I was young, I was not very healthy and I, no one understood why. So early on, when the Beatles came back from the Maharishi and we thought this was the dawning of the age of Aquarius and there was the beginning of transcendental meditation and Timothy Leary were talking about drop out, drop in, and we were looking at higher consciousness. So I learned that your body is a temple and you are what you eat and digest. So I started eating organic food, doing yoga, doing detoxes. I spent several years shadowing Bernard Jensen at his Hidden Valley Health Ranch. He was really a major person to pass and, and investigate functional medicine when it was in its early infancy. And even though I was doing everything right, I kept getting cancers and I kept getting ill. So usually people bump into functional medicine when they're a typical American or a typical global citizen and they eat what's put in front of them or what tastes good, then they get ill and they're fighting for their life and they see the functional medicine light. I had the opposite experience. I was doing everything right, things that most people start to do when they get a diagnosis of cancer, detoxes, vegan-esque eating, all organic, all through school, I had my own goats, made my own goat milk, tried to make my own goat cheese and butter, which was very comedic. So nobody could figure out why I was so ill. And I read an article in the early 1990s that the planet was becoming rife with pollutants that could compete with our own hormones called endocrine disruptors. And I had done initially in my early career a rotation in integrative medicine with Dr. Jonathan Wright. He's considered the father of bioidentical hormones only because a female patient said to him, I don't really want to, I want hormones, but I don't want Premarin horse estrogen. Could you, can't you write me an I, bioidentical hormone? So a lot of times big advances in medicine are made by grassroots questions and women who ask things and people who get together and really have their voice be heard. So he listened to that patient and he wrote the very first scripts. And then he ultimately created the first laboratory testing for hormones, Meridian Laboratory. So I had been looking at hormones every which way since I started in practice many years ago. And when I read that the planet, so I realized that hormones are the most powerful signaling molecules in the human body. That's why my last book is referred to as Sexy Brain, because sex steroid hormones rule the brain. And if you want to roll back mild and moderate cognitive decline, you want to take a look at hormonal status because sex hormones really rule the brain. Mm -hmm. So since I've been testing hormones, treating hormones, looking at hormones for so many decades, when I started bumping into the early literature that we were, it was almost impossible to live like a Seinfeld bubble boy, avoiding all of these hormonally disrupting pollutants, I decided to try and take a look at writing a book on this topic, which then led me to six years of research, because back in the late 1990s, nobody had heard the term endocrine disruptors. I published that book called Hormone Deception. It, in a three-month period, the books that would shake the shoulders of our consciousness that the planetary pollution 
was obscuring and assaulting and competing with our own hormones were three books that came out in a three month period, Our Stolen Future, Hormonal Chaos, and my book, Hormone Deception. Those three books really were leading scientists and the lay public that we've got a problem we didn't realize before. We knew about carcinogens, but we didn't know about endocrine disruptors. And based on that book, I was invited to be a distinguished scholar at the center, as you just mentioned, Center for Bioenvironmental Research. And there I got to work with the scientists who were the world's experts on hormones, and also the two scientists who discovered how hormones signal, because up until Elwood Jensen's discovery, we thought that hormones work through enzymatic reactions. And he was the first scientist that said no. A hormone speaks to a satellite dish called a receptor. I mean, there are other ways hormones signal, but the basic way is a hormone wiggling into a receptor. And that receptor, these signals are so powerful for reproduction, for cognition, for heart health, brain health, kidney health, vocal cord health, for so many different tissue functionalities that if it's so important that these signals get into the receptor, the receptor is very malleable, so they won't miss those signals. Because they're malleable, therein lies the issue with pollutants. All a pollutant has to do is be shaped just a little itty bitty like our own endogenous, what our own body makes hormones. They can swim on in to a receptor. And even though you go to a doctor and get a perfect level testing in a either blood, saliva, urine, whichever way you test a hormone, that doesn't mean it's functional, that it can get into that receptor. So for many years, I got to hang out with the people who were looking at hormones every which way. For example, I got to hang out with Lou Gillet and his wife, Elizabeth. I write about them quite a bit in Hormone Deception. He was the he-man that was capturing alligators in the polluted Lake Apopka in Southern Florida. He was an embryologist at the University of Florida. And he was capturing... He was a he-man, like he stepped out of, I'll date myself, the old Irish spring commercials, this handsome guy. And he'd catch these alligators and tie them to surfboards. And he would open them up and show that they had ovaries and eggs, even though they were male alligators. And their penises were way too small, which is called in humans, altered shape of a penis, hypospadia. So they also captured female alligators and showed that they were being masculinized. So there was gender bending going on observant in the 1990s. He went and testified along with Gore. We tried to raise the think tank, tried to raise, at the time it seemed like a lot of money, $5 million to test a hunk of chemicals to see if they acted like endocrine disruptors because we felt this was going to cause havoc with fertility, with brain function, with many ways, just even contributing to type two, the increasing epidemic of type two diabetes and obesity, because many of these pollutants also act as something that Bruce Blumberg from the University of California has now labeled obesogens. So Lou and Mm -hmm. Gore went to the Senate elect committee in the government. And Lou is famous for this line, no man in this room is half the man that his grandfather was, because These pollutants are lowering testosterone in males, increasing testosterone in females. We worried then about gender bending. What are we seeing now? It's probably also some sociologic components because nothing is ever a perfect storm without several streams leading into it. But who would think that pollution is part of your child's identity crisis because of the gender bending? Tyrone Hayes was at Berkeley. He was the nemesis of the atrazine industry. He was saying that he could expose pregnant frogs to varying levels of atrazine and make her maphroditic tadpoles. So we could change sexuality by exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals, either the egg or the sperm, or while the mother was pregnant. And this was then having transgenerational or far reaching effects. So this has become a big focus of mine. And then the middle of all of this, I got breast cancer. And of course, clinically, everybody said you can never be on hormones. But as I was doing much of this research, I realized that that didn't really seem accurate. If you track, there's actually about 26 studies with only one of them uh, 
showing adverse effects, but that means 25 studies have given breast cancer replacement to women who have had breast cancer, tracked them for two to 26 years with matched cohorts, meaning in, done in a scientific manner, and the women fared better. They had less recurrence, less fatality if they did have recurrence. So I started diving into hormones every which way. And all of a sudden, my book came out in 2000, Hormone Deception. And up till that time, 18 million women in America had been given the promise to be feminine forever if they took estrogen, usually from a horse, Premarin, conjugated equine estrogen, or mixed with a progestin. And that combo pill was called Prempro. Most of American adult women were on these hormones. It was starting to be observed that America is an aging country. In fact, very soon, I think in about seven years, it's said that we'll have more people 65 and older than we'll have younger people as our citizens. So since women live longer than men, the government wanted to be able not to topple social security. So it started what's called the Women's Health Initiative. And it wanted to look at every which way to keep women healthier, longer, and not topple social security. So the first thing they looked at was hormones because so many women were already on it. And by the way, 20 plus countries around the world now give hormones for free when a woman turns in her 50s or a gent does, because when they track the results of it, they see it doesn't topple their socialized medicine. We're talking all the Nordic countries, Wales, Ireland, Britain got on this last year, Italy, that means Iceland, Finland, Greenland, Norway, all those countries now give hormones for free because when they have tracked the results of it, people stay healthier, better, longer, which is what we all thought up until the Women's Health Initiative. So the Women's Health Initiative was 40 prestigious institutions getting together with the government saying, let's do a number of randomized trials. We have right now a mesmerization with randomized trials. But if you read reevaluations by statisticians at Stanford and Yale about the concept and phenomena of randomized trials, they show in whatever randomized trials are redone, often 35% of them don't give the same results that it did the first time. They actually end up being weak. They're much weaker than we would have thought. We give, think that it's the stamp of science. That's what we wanted to get with ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine in the pandemic. But randomized trials are not that easy to do, and they're very questionable about the outcomes, but the Women's Health Initiative was using randomized trials, and the first thought was, let's do randomized trials on hormones. So they had about eight to 10,000 women in an all Premarin or horse estrogen arm, and eight to 10,000 women on Prempro, which was conjugated equine estrogen with medroxyprogesterone acetate, the combo pill. And they all thought, we're going to follow these women and see that they're feminine forever. And when we're just going to put women on hormones, it's going to be a great thing. But those studies were stopped prematurely because the early statistics looked like we made a terrible mistake, that hormones were causing the very things we thought they would prevent, breast cancer, adverse cardiovascular events like clots. So everybody stopped. Wyeth, who is producing these many of these meds, got successfully sued, and the black darkness of hormones began in the United States. After the Women's Health Initiative, the statistical fiasco that it was made everybody shake in their shoes. Most gynecologists to this day, if you ask them if you are a candidate, for hormones, they'll tell you they don't believe in hormones. They cause breast cancer, so only take them for North American Menopause Society that kind of sets the guidelines for gynecologists. Says to gynecologists and doctors that tend to ladies, hey, you know, only give them for the shortest period of time. You don't even need to test for them. They're so benign, but only give them a short period of time because after five years, they could cause the very problems we thought that they were preventative of. Now, mind you, the rest of the world did not stop using hormones. They looked at us and thought, these Americans, mm -hmm. they're so enamored with randomized trials. And 
clinically, we've only seen women do better clinically. And when they track in socialized medicine, their death registries, breast cancer registries, prostate cancer for gent registries, cardiovascular adverse events, the nasty things that really take us to the next incarnation, heart attack and stroke, those registries, those uh, many countries around the world have only seen people do better on them. But our first randomized trials put, made the lawyers jump out of their chair and say, we've got lawsuits. They sued a lot of the docs. They sued Wyeth and they stopped teaching hormones in med school In naturopathic school. It, it's minimal in osteopathic school. It really became the black hole of medicine where you think a urologist, gynecologist, this sounds like a joke and, uh, and an <laughs> endocrinologist should be the overseers of hormones. Most people thought, you know, hormones drive cancer. And women bought this hook, line, and sinker. You mentioned estrogen replacement. I was just talking yep. to a lady at a dinner the other evening. And now, of course, I had breast cancer 30 years ago. I've been on hormone replacement for about 26 years. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned to her, you know, it's all turning around. She goes, no, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Nobody wants to talk about it. And they almost unconsciously put their arms over their, their breasts because everyone's fearful that estrogen causes breast cancer when... So uh, so when the Women's Health Initiative came out in July of 2002, mm -hmm. I sat there reading the results. I remember this clearly, right in this chair, in this office. And I went, F that, F that yeah. is inaccurate, F that. So I spent three years diving into the literature because everyone was saying now, no longer do hormones in the United States. I spent three years writing Safe Hormones, Smart Women looking at the science every which way and showing that it wasn't accurate. Now, mind you, a lot of people have been uncomfortable with how things have been unfolded, especially Leon Spiroff. Right. He writes the main books that OBGYNs are teased on. Um, he started pumping out articles saying, don't listen to this one study. We got to reevaluate this. Stephen Naftalin, a major statistician at Yale, started taking apart all the statistics and seeing that there were lots of holes in it. And a guy named Houdis really jumped on it. He published a paper, fast forward in 2018, he discovered that a major issue with the Women's Health Initiative was, so you have an experimental arm where you give them, the women, the hormones. Mm -hmm. And then you've got what you call matched cohorts, women who are matched so that you're basically dealing with a similar demographic. And they're called a match cohort, but they're given placebo so that you can test the difference. Right. Well, in the control arm, they forgot to ever ask any of the women if they'd ever been on estrogen. So they didn't control for historical use of estrogen. Mm -hmm. And the 19-year reanalysis, which was published so every year in San Antonio, there's a breast cancer symposium where breast cancer researchers from all over the world and major highly respected institutions get together. 2019, December 19th, 12 very prestigious cancer institutions like from Harvard and Stanford and Fred Hutchinson Research Center, they reanalyzed the Women's Health Initiative after Huda said the whole methodology sucked. It was ridiculous. It couldn't come out with the right answer. And when they had, you know, hindsight is 2020, when they looked back and did a deep dive and redid the statistics so much for randomized trials, right. they were able to show that if a woman was ever on estrogen just a year or a few years, it decreased her incidence of getting breast cancer by 23%, almost you know, 25%, which is unbelievable. And if she got breast cancer with a history of being on hormones or while she was on hormones, it decreased her risk of dying from this disease, which is enormous by 44%, almost 50%. They republished this in 2019. It's called the 19 year reanalysis. Did this make headline news? Like the bad news made headline news in 2002? No, 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 no. So the Women's Health Initiative, the fateful first statistical fiasco blush was in July, 2002. So everyone was frightened of hormones, not me, but everyone was frightened, mostly everyone was frightened of hormones. In October, the Cache County studies out of Utah were published where they took healthy people in their 50s and it was a prospective study and they looked at them as they went into the future and they said, who gets dementia and who doesn't? And what did they do differently? 
Well, they found that if women were on estrogen for 10 years, depending on which spinoff study you read, she had a decreased incidence of getting Alzheimer's by 40 to 50%. Nothing else has ever shown that protection. And then right. University of Arizona published about six, seven months ago, an insurance study where they looked at 400,000 insurees to see who got dementia and who didn't and what they did in their past, what meds they had been on and so forth. And they were able to show that if a woman had been on hormones for five years, if she'd been on any kind of hormone for five years, she had about a 60 some percent decreased incidence of Alzheimer's. But if she'd been on bioidentical hormones, the hormones that are the same shape and look molecularly like the ones that mother nature gifted us, there was almost a 79%, almost an 80% reduction in cognitive decline or Alzheimer's disease. And last week, a study that also did not make headline news came out of the NIH, the National Institute of Health, <clears throat> and the National Library of Medicine. They got together with Medicare. They looked at 7 million. Did you hear this study, Dr. No, Martin? I haven't heard this one yet. No, I'm, I'm interested. 7 million Medicare people. And they looked to see who had dementia, who had the bad cancers for women. It was breast, uterine, ovarian, and colorectal. And for gents, it was prostate cancer, which many, many men get as they age, and colorectal. Mm -hmm. And their data showed that if women had been on hormone replacement for five years, they had a 33%, the same percentage that was found in the, women, in the reanalysis of the Women's Health Initiative, decreased incidence of breast cancer. If you were on estrogen, you had 33% less breast cancer and not just less breast cancer, less ovarian cancer, less uh, uterine cancer and less colorectal cancer, which is cancer of the colon and the, the southerly part of the colon is the rectum. So it's called colorectal cancer. Mm -hmm. And the statistics were the same for men. If men had been on testosterone for about five years, they also had a 33% decreased incidence of prostate cancer or colorectal cancer. And the other real amazing thing that this didn't make headline news all over the world is that people live longer, five to 10 years, statistically longer with better quality of health, with comorbidities, how you get really ill toward the end, compressed. So you had a healthier, longer, you were younger, longer on hormones. And now what we're seeing is hormones protect against cancer, mm -hmm. against multiple hormonally driven cancers. They help you live longer, safer. And it, th this information is just, most doctors don't know any of this information. Most gynecologists don't know this information, endocrinologists. This has really been kept more quiet, very similarly to the ways that frontline COVID care alliance interventionals for the we won't go to COVID, but so I love having this opportunity because as you know, I'm going to be 74 in a few months. Which is, I guess, I just, <laughs> I can't, I, I just can't. <laughs> I mean, I know people are going to be listening to this as a podcast, but if you just look her up, just look her up. And I mean, you can hear Dr. B, your voice has not changed. And I remember you saying that in one of your podcasts, you, you also you mentioned have that hormone when you receptors did, all over your vocal cords. Yeah. Your voice has not changed. You've not, you've not gotten into the, I hate to say old lady voice, but it's just true. I'm, you look like you're in your fifties. No joke. When, when I, I lecture now, when I lecture now, so if I, let's say I'm lecturing in the gastroenterology module for A4M, the relicensing module for docs that want to become functional docs, or, mm -hmm. you know, they, people hear my age, they don't want to hear what I'm lecturing about. I'm surrounded by them at the break because they, everyone's frightened of aging and they don't want to age. You know, they want to stay younger, longer and the safety of hormones and the power of hormones. And so I ask this of all of my doctors when I talk on hormones in the last few months, I've been lecturing at quite a number of medical continuing medical education conferences talking about the research giving hormone replacement to ER positive breast cancer patients and to prostate we'll to cancer talk about patients. That. Yeah, we're going to dive and into I that. And I say to them, so think about it. Why would mother nature make the very hormones that drive humanity? You know, these hormones, we think of them as sexy things and reproductive things, but COVID showed us that all our immune cells, our dendritic cells, our Treg cells, our white blood cells, they all have receptors for estrogen and progesterone. That's why 
men died more from COVID and women died less if they were premenopausal and if they were postmenopausal on estrogen, they died even less compared to women who had less hormones on board. Why? Because mm -hmm. hormones help your immune system function. Yep. So why would mother nature make the very hormones that drive homo sapiens, the human race, why would she make those cancer causing? So Abraham Morgenthaler is on the same mission as me. I lectured with him in Miami a few months ago at an anti-aging CME course for medical doctors. And I heard him and I was so in awe. I connect the dots of many people's research. He actually does the research. And he, he was an associate professor of urology at Harvard. And he's on the same mission to let men know. And he says the same thing. Why would mother nature make testosterone that drives humanity pro-carcinogenic and men that are have had prostate cancer do better if they get back on hormone replacement? And if you're on hormone replacement, you have less aggressive prostate cancer and you tend to die less from the disease, even the same with stroke. But if you go to most cardiologists or most doctors, this information is not yet mainstream. Hormones have been blacked out ever since 2002, blacked out. So I'm trying to open the windows and let the sunlight in and yeah. let you see that you can have muscles and, and stamina. Most of my friends that have, were very frightened, understandably, of hormones, they're searching for words. They're not talking the same. They're shuffling. Aging is diverse, but if you want to age better, hormones must be a part of that foundational a tool bag that you develop. Absolutely. A hundred percent. So wait, before we get into the, I want to dive into that estrogen receptor breast cancer, because I have so many patients that either they have that in their family or they had it themselves. And now their doctors are scaring them away from hormone hormones. Before we go there, I just want the universal question answered. Why aren't doctors up to date on all of these studies that you just gave us with nothing but positive results with hormones. And like you also mentioned, it's just common sense. Why would, if, if hormones cause cancer, we'd have a bunch of 13, 14 and 15 year olds with cancer. So right, cancer why happens more doctors? when you're older with less hormones on board and it happens less pregnancy is protective and you get exposed to more hormones. And so, you know, that is really the million, wasn't there a TV show called the million dollar question? Was that the name of the show? Something like that. Something this like that, is yeah. the million dollar question. Every, you know, medicine is like trying to move the Titanic away from the icebergs. It was so hard. It was impossible to move that Titanic. They saw the iceberg, but not in time. They were moving, moving. If you saw the movie Titanic, it was screeching, screeching, and they just couldn't avoid the icebergs. Medicine moves slowly. And that which trickles down into the clinical trenches is often extremely biased old, old thoughts and folklore that should no longer be guiding clinical traffic are still there. And it's really, most doctors have no time to keep up with the literature. They lean on their own associations. ACOG and um, the GYN associations are extremely conservative. The North American Menopause Society is extremely conservative. The data is so building up that you know in another 20, 25 years, everyone's going to be on it, but it's going to be who, who makes the most money from it is going to guide that traffic because right. um, the old CEOs of Premarin and Prempro badmouthed bioidentical hormones forever, but after the Women's Health Initiative, all their stock tanked. So what did they do? They created a bioidentical hormone and started taking it yep. through phase one and two and three trials, which they got it through. And they now have a company called Therapeutics MD, which are all the old CEOs of the old companies that were successful before the Women's Health Initiative. And now they're touting and writing about the benefits and the safety of bi It's all turning that way. Your doc just hasn't turned that way yet because yeah. what they learned in school scared the bejesus out of them. And of course, when Wyeth got successfully sued, if you work your butt off for a license and it keeps bread on the table and your identity happening, you want to, you're scared to death, understandably, to lose that license. And women became piranhas along with their lawyers to sue, sue, sue. So everyone said, whoa, I'm going to stand back. I don't want to get sued. I want to stay a doctor. Yep. So women have to take part of that responsibility. We are a litigious 
Sue Happy Society that makes everybody scared to do anything. We're afraid to tell anyone that most of the people in the ICUs with COVID were overweight and obese. We're so afraid of being called a fat shamer. We're scared to death of every thing, Everything. single thing. And yep. suing is part and losing your license is part of that. So women have lost out now, really lost out. And they better, they have to own up. The doctors have to own up because the science is just, it's happening now one after another. We're talking a 7 million person Medicare study coming out. It didn't make headline news last week. It was extraordinary. That's so, unbelievable. I go to my cancer doctor every year. I go to a surgeon because they have the best palpating fingers. And every year I go into her because I don't want to get a mammogram every year. Right. So I, I go in and let her palpate my breasts. And every year she says, you look better than any other breast cancer patient I have. You better stop taking hormones. Same breath. But she's a surgeon. She doesn't know the data on hormones. And so, of course, she's been frightened of hormones. And she's about 25 years younger than me. And now she looks older than me. Uh-huh. Yep. But she can see you. How can she look at you and look at your health record and still tell you to stop taking hormones? You're well, walking. Well, that's through. like, you know, if we have, so I opened up a functional renal program where I now work at um, Naples Center for Functional Medicine. And we have a lot of people, women in their 80s that were at stage three kidney decline. And mm -hmm. in a few months, not in everyone that fast, we normalize their renal function. So their nephrologist fires them, but they never ask, what did you do? Right. Never ask, what did you do? And they don't have the time. They have the way that they do things, the way that it's always been done, the way their association is said to do it, the way they won't get sued if they do this standard of care. And mm -hmm. so they're not interested in stepping outside the standard of care because otherwise they'll be at risk of being sued. That's true. That's true. Yeah. And I mean, it's, the, it's follow the money trail, no matter what topic, whether it's hormones or COVID, follow the money trail. So yeah, exactly. Now, now I'll open that door for the estrogen receptor breast cancer. Those patients that they come to me too. I love BHRT and they go, uh, but yeah, I can't do that. I can't do that because I had ER positive breast cancer or even P positive. There's just a progesterone positive breast cancer, right? Am I wrong? Well, there's, mo there's ER positive, PR positive, HER2 new positive. There's also triple negative. Um, and there's all these ways of trying to look at markers of a tumor, the, care the personality type of a tumor, so that you can try and get the best treatment for a patient to deal with the personality type of the tumor. That's why they have all those, the tumor profiling. You know, cancer is very difficult. Nixon declared the war of cancer in 1971, and we haven't won it yet, then, except in certain certain areas, you know, like testicular cancer and mm. breast cancer. We're actually doing really well. Most women do not die from breast cancer anymore. And we, when we do work with hormones with a patient, we have them do regular care and mix it together with functional care so that they're getting the best of both worlds. But there's two camps of looking at what drives, it's, I'm making it very simplistic, cancer. And one is, is your growth signals from estrogen overwhelming your growth control signals from estrogen. So those are the people who worry that estrogen is going to be driving and fueling the cancer, especially in a woman who has a personality type of an ER positive, meaning she has estrogen receptors on that tumor. Okay. Or is it that actually your stem cells are driving cancer and stem cells don't have receptors on them and they are not driven by estrogen? So part of it becomes of looking back at normal breast physiology and your glands and most of your breast cells all have estrogen receptors, progesterone receptors, HER2 new receptors. That's what a normal breast cell depending on the tissue you're looking at, have. And so another way of looking at it rather than ER positive is, is the tumor type. So you have to avoid estrogen so you don't fuel that growth of that tumor type is boy, that cell is still looking a lot like the cell it was when it was a normal cell inside this woman's breast when it was normal. And that is only saying that the cancer isn't that bad. It's not saying that estrogen fuels it. It's just saying it has the remnant of its old archetypal normal physiology. And that's why when you lose all those receptors, that's a triple negative breast cancer, for example, no receptors for estrogen, 
no receptors for progesterone, no receptors for HER2 news. So that's three receptors, don't have any, so they call it triple negative. Mm -hmm. Often people do much worse. And the, the another new perception of that is that's because now the cell is given itself completely up to the cancer and there's no remnant of its normal older physiology. So a woman comes in and goes, I can't take estrogen. I'm ER positive. It'll fuel it. Right. But you know, let's look at the science. Let's, so I just spoke at um, last August 13th, I spoke at the North Carolina Integrative Medical Society and in Dearborn, Michigan, about two and a half months ago, I spoke at David Brownstein's group called the Integrative College of um, Inter uh, Integrative Me International College of Integrative Medicine, ICIM, and I got the highest score out of 10 years of, of, of lecturers because people were so blown away by the data. And I said, this is going to be a little boring, but let's take all 26 studies where they gave breast cancer patients, many of them ER positive, they gave them either Premarin, which is horse's estrogen, mm -hmm. or estradiol, which is like the 17 beta estradiol that our own ovaries make, right? Or um, some of the studies gave estrogen and progesterone. None of these studies happen to give testosterone, which is, happens to be one of the first preventative hormones that we now do give or recommend to a woman. And we love to work along with her oncologist and her team. So everyone's on board. They all learn the science so we can make all these decisions together. It's not done in a, in a, in a, slimy hidden way and make right. enemies and you want you want a team and you want everybody's good sense because you never know where you get a pearl and no one doctor knows everything so you want right. to keep your team so we we like to work in that way so mm -hmm. in that talk i went through each of those studies from the university of wisconsin from md anderson from it'd be shocking some of the studies followed women over 25 years and in every study but one, women who had breast cancer who were given hormones after the diagnosis of breast cancer, many of them ER positive, had less recurrence of it coming back, protected them. And if it did come back, they had less incidence of dying from it. So it protected them even more. Mm -hmm. All the while, they had a higher quality of life. They had little, less little old lady voice. They had their brain that was still on. They weren't searching for words. They could really walk rapidly. They could yep. build muscle because muscle helps keep you young. And if you don't have testosterone hormones on board, you're vulnerable to sarcopenia, which is yep. the age-related loss of muscles. And then everyone says, how come I can never lose weight and I can't gain any muscle? Well, hormones are a big part of that story. Exactly. So the research itself is shocking that there have been so many studies, most of them by very prestigious American institutes, some of them done in Slovenia and little outliers. But it's shocking when you take a look at the research and show that it does not support our fear of estrogen driving cancer. Mm -hmm. And there's um, a book out that I really love called Estrogen Matters by Avram Blooming, although yep. he has been for many years on the board of Wyeth. Now he says he's no longer on the board and he's anti-bioidentical hormones and all of his research has been done with Premarin. So what yeah. we learned in the last few years, we used to badmouth all patentable hormones, say just bioidentical was good, but we've all been humbled. And we've seen that any hormone, even if it's a patentable altered hormone or non an other species hormone, mm -hmm. like estrogen from horses, is better than no hormone since hormones are so incredibly protective. The best, bioidentical, as the University of Arizona study showed, it, a decreased incidence of Alzheimer's disease by 79%. And there are gerontology symposiums happening all over the world now saying there's no cure for Alzheimer's disease. There's no prevention other than exercise and eating better. But mm -hmm. hormones really are are curative as well, if it's mild and moderate, as well as preventative. So hormones are a time that is about ready to burst open. Good. But most of the that. doctors haven't been trained on how to test and, and, and replace with them. That's the problem because most schools have said they're dangerous. They drive breast cancer. You should be very wary if you even just... So MD Anderson now, which leads the world in cancer intervention, mm -hmm. has a great reputation. They've now opened in the last few years um, a branch called 
the Cancer Preventative Center. And they take a high risk woman and treat her for cancer to prevent her getting cancer. Okay. This is one of the new things coming down. It's horrifying. I mean, hysterectomies in women in their 30s because- Okay, then that's know, what they're doing for prevention. Right. So if a woman had, for example, an atypical uh, lobular hyperplasia biopsy, so that's not cancer, but it gives you 11 times the incidence of getting it. It's not yeah. cancer yet. Now I give that woman iodine, progesterone, look at testosterone, look at the bigger picture. What they want to do is they want to put her on tamoxifen for five years, take a look at her endometrial stripe, maybe give her a hysterectomy, even if she hasn't had kids. That's um, what's coming down the pike on this hand. This other hand are the real protection hormones. So we're about ready to see this mushroom. And what you'll want to do is go to people who really know the science and who also have under their belt some years of working with these people, because it's not as easy as slapping hormones on a breast cancer patient. You want to have markers, markers of inflammation and of cellular DNA change that you track as you're giving them possible hormones or taking care of them. So you're just not throwing something at them and saying, trust me, this is better. Whatever yeah. you want to do, you want to track them. So this has become my passion to try and share this information. I know. I love it. And that's why I brought you on because people need to hear an expert talk about it instead of me just saying, no, trust me, they're good. <laughs> but you know, it's, just, it's what we're seeing, I think, in, in conventional medicine with hormones and cancer is the same thing. And I should know the answer to that question as to the why doctors aren't informed. It's the same thing that I see with thyroid. And doctors are still testing and relying on TSH. We can't even get them to test free T3 and reverse T3 these days. So how can I expect those doctors who won't even run the test to even have a clue how protective real bioidentical hormones are? So it, it's the same thing. They are just, just like you said, Dr. B, they're just stuck in their way of thinking and what they learned in med school and have not broken out of that box whatsoever have not read a recent study, have not used their mind to think outside of the box. And this isn't even that far outside of the box. We have all of the studies that you, you've, you've notated here that prove that hormones are safe, that prove that they are very anti-aging and not just anti-aging to look like Raquel Welch or look as damn good as you, but, but to actually protect the body. I have Alzheimer's in my family. Absolutely, I'm doing hormones. I'm already on progesterone, testosterone. When it's time for estrogen, that's coming in too. So, yeah, I just you know I it's crazy. You. Like you know, there's a vulnerability gene for Alzheimer's, the ApoE4 gene yep. family. Well, testosterone shuts the gene expression of that up. I write, I have a whole chapter on that in Sexy Brain. The Japanese have seen this for about 15 years now. That if you some a lot of gynecologists, if they do give hormones, just give estrogen, and progesterone. They don't think that testosterone has much to do with anything except making you horny. And if it doesn't work, why do it? But pro testosterone protects against breast cancer in the breast. Mm -hmm. Testosterone protects against autoimmune disease because it reboots secretory IgA, which is yep. your number one immunoglobulin that licks and tastes whatever gains entry from the outside world into you. And it also protects against that vulnerability gene of Alzheimer's and helps maintain the volume of that part of your brain where memories are consolidated, the hippocampus. So actually I'm getting together with a group of docs that we wanna put a board certification program together for hormones. The only thing is, is that each doc's got their own way and they're selling it or they're this and they're bad mouthing everybody else. And you can't have unity if you bad mouth everybody else. Some right. people say saliva is the only way to test and no other way is good. Some people say testosterone is dangerous for more women who are postmenopausal. Really, that's as shocking to me as then yeah. some people say all bases and creams have toxic stuff in it and only mine doesn't. So you have to push all that away and be a unified family and say, let's get the scientific facts of hormones out there and let women, let's train the docs to all these different ways, let them find their own stride for what works for them and their patients, mm -hmm. and then educate women to do it. But that's the problem with all of this is the lack of unity and people saying, oh, only oral estrogen works. Oh, you should never do oral estrogen. Oh, I only saliva testing if you test any other way. You know, they, doctors get into 
my way or the highway and we lose our power as a unified group. And I don't want to see it be lost to those details. The details are we want to be able to check our hormonal footprint every decade and work with physicians who can help us when our hormonal footprint gets muddy and makes it stronger again for us. There's many ways to do that. And we have to fight for our rights because it's going to come down to fighting for the dollar. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have a preferred, since you mentioned delivery systems, do you have a preferred delivery system for estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, or are you kind of all about whatever the docs want to do and whatever works for the patient? Well, you know, the average woman is going to be in menopause a third to a half of her life. So you're going to be, I just came in from the lake. I didn't sleep well last night. I jumped in the lake. So now I'm like sweating. I'm so passionate here. So you're going to be on hormones a long time. Yeah. I want to be the most hormonally balanced ashes in the crematorium. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) So what works for you? Now, a lot of docs say topical works for most of their patients, but I don't know, topicals never worked for me. So I tend to attract patients who topicals don't work so well for. So I've had to learn all kinds of delivery. Wait, delivery mode is the way you get the hormone into you. There's many delivery modes. And if you put hormones into your vagina, that's called a mucosal delivery or first vaginal pass. There's different benefits by different bases and different companies make those different bases. So there's a lot of nuances to hormones. Just like, you know, if you get organic food at Walmart, it's not the same nutrient density as organic food as the farmer's market where they pulled it and just two hours later are selling it to you around the corner in the parking lot of your, of your, you know, of a strip mall. Right. Or so there's layers of organic food. There's the farmer's market, then Whole Foods, and then there's Walmart. So there's different layers. Those organic foods are better than non organic foods, but they are different. And hormones are different. They're micronized to different sizes. And the more micronized a hormone is, the more bioavailable it is, but the more expensive it is. And you don't know if even your compounding pharmacist is on the cheap because of whatever's going on in their life and their family and their rent or, or et cetera, so that they're doing that. So there's so many nuances to hormone health. And then, as I said early on, the receptor functionality is where the rubber meets the road of hormones. Mm -hmm. More than the delivery mode and more than the testing, it's can the hormone get in and can it shimmy in space genomically sending the signal to the gene So based on working with Elwood Jensen, who discovered the first receptor, ER-alpha, estrogen receptor alpha, alpha means the first, and then Yanaki Gustafsson, who discovered ER-beta, the second receptor, there's about 12 receptors. We don't even know yet what some of those receptors do. So it's not like hormones are a done discrete deal and we know all the data. It's unfolding, but nonetheless, it's, it's the receptor functionality. And so I've decided to design a product that because co- we're constantly exposed to chemicals that sit on these receptors. So no matter what delivery mode we get it in, our mm-hmm. hormones can't get in. So I've designed a, a product that cleans off your receptors and gives all the nutrients. So you have a, a receptor, the satellite dish is also a bowl. So you eat well and digest well to make your hormones work. So the receptor on its side is like a bowl. So you have vitamin A, iodine, magnesium, zinc, pyridoxal 5-phosphate, the active form of B6. You got a clump of nutrients if they're not there and you're taking hormones, but you're low in zinc, for example, you won't get the benefit. It won't Mm -hmm. work. So I put together products to clean off the receptor, give all those what are called transcriptional cofactors. And then I have another product called Hormone Balance and Protect. I designed Metagenics, as you mentioned in my intro, yeah. their first femline. So I took a lot of what I learned back then, and I've created a product that keeps your hormones zen throughout the day, which is no small feat, makes the hormones extremely bioavailable, especially estrogen and testosterone. Mm-hmm. Also lower sex hormone binding globulin, which if it's elevated, even if you're on hormones, you don't get a lot out of it. And then because everyone's afraid of cancer. So, so because I was a DES daughter, I didn't really finish that story, but I just kept getting cancer after cancer after cancer. And when I started diving into endocrine disruption, I wrote away from my mother's birth records and discovered that she took 
while she was pregnant with me, a prenatal vitamin and also an injection of the number one most powerful endocrine disruptor ever invented. It was banned in 1971 as the most powerful cancer causing substance ever invented. And once I realized that I was doing everything right, but getting the wrong outcomes, because it was epigenetically set up in the womb, mm -hmm. then I went on a sleuth to find out what would reconstitute my tumor suppressor genes that this medication damaged. And that led me to all other sorts of knowing how to work with my breast cancer patients, my prostate cancer patients, and how to keep myself well. So in the second product, I have put together these botanicals that I have learned to lean on over the last few decades, because I had so many cancers and everyone said, well, fickle finger fate, bad deal of the genetic cards, just got to suck it up and age gracefully. Well, no, no, no. I wanted to figure out how, how to make my remission my mission. Yeah. So I discovered a whole sleuth of high quality herbs that are what are called growth controllers. Cancer is growth out of control. There are herbs that have been tested against multiple cancer cell lines. And um, I use the ones, of course, that worked against my cancer cell lines and then other mm -hmm. cancer cell lines for both men and women. And I put that, so one product is called Receptor Detox. I have them here. This cleans off the receptors and gives all the transcriptional cofactors. Mm -hmm. And this one is called Hormone Balance and Protect. And we are having, we just, these products just launched a few months ago and conditions that I didn't even think were treatable, like adenomyosis. I, yeah. I mean, I, I told uh, this woman who came to see me, you're going to have to have surgery. There's no treatment. It's internal endometriosis in the muscular layer of the uterus. There's, she, she found it out through an MRI, mm -hmm. usually it's through surgery. I said, this isn't going to work. She said, well, let me try it. Lo and behold, she now has had three periods that have been totally normal for the wow. first time in seven years. So it's pretty exciting. These are like multis. Since you're exposed to chemicals all the time in your shower, in your paint, in the flooring, yep. everywhere you go, and sitting in the car, car exhaust. So these are daily supplements to make your receptors work well and to keep your hormones balanced, whether you're on hormones or not on hormones. If you haven't started hormone replacement yet, you can double up on the detox to really clear off your receptors for a week ahead of time. Several mm -hmm. times a year, you can double up on the detox because normally it's just one twice a day. Yeah. These are daily supplements to keep your hormones, which are your most powerful signaling molecules to keep your brain smart, your vocal cords going, your lungs, your body, your energy, your muscles. These are the deal that no one talks about. You're, you can go get a physical from your loving family doc and they'll never ask you about hormones. Now, what would right. we see as practitioners if, someone, if someone's receptor sites weren't functioning properly? Would we see an increase in their hormone levels while giving hormones and just kind of an abnormal spike? Would we see estrogen dominance? What would we see on labs or would it just be more of a kind of how the person feels, they're just not improving despite giving the hormones. So there is no, there's only in academia, do they have a way of really showing that there's rece receptor dysfunctionality, but at the moment, clinically, we don't have a test for it, mm -hmm. but hormones rule several basic things. So I say, if your hormones are balanced, if they're signaling well, you sleep well, you think well, you talk really easily, you're not searching for words, Right. You develop muscle in response to working out. You're not battling fatigue and crashes of energy. And you go to the bathroom at least twice a day. So you're, because you have hormone receptors all yeah. throughout your entire gastrointestinal tract. So to think that gastroenterologists never look at these hormones when they're so protective of the gut, you know, we, because we have certifications in separate genres of medicine, medicine has become fragmented. And unfortunately, hormones pull a lot of that system together. But the caretakers of the hormones have gone a different way. And the people who their genre looks at a tissue, like there's a lot of receptors in heart tissue, but cardiologists don't believe in hormones. There's a lot of receptors in your small and large intestine. But gastroenterologists would never deal with I made a presentation to Austin Regional Gastroenterology on um, seven of their patients that we had mutually. Some had had a colectomy where the, their colon was removed and several were told they had to have a colectomy stat. None of them had cancer, mm -hmm. but I worked, young women in their 20s, I worked by giving them hormones that heal 
the gut wall, along with a number of different things. And then within six months, the follow-up colonoscopies looked like they never had evidence of Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. So I thought, I got to go talk to the gastroenterologist there. So to their, you know, they were good guys. They mm -hmm. were all guys. None of them were ladies. My own gastroenterologist was there. He's a really good guy, Dr. Zebert. And they all listened to me. And they all said, you're a geek, but we would never do anything with hormones. God bless you for saving the colon of these women, but we're not interested. Keep doing what you're doing, but we don't really want to know, which is oh. how it unfolds because yeah. people do what they do and what they're taught to do. They've got their procedures, their way of doing it. They're not going to suddenly change. And that's where the functional doc comes in. So hopefully we need to train a lot of functional docs that are open to this. And hopefully a lot of gynecologists will get trained in this. But the problem is, is everybody's frightened of hormones. Yep. They have a misunderstanding of them. They're afraid of getting sued. Women are afraid of getting breast cancer when it's the opposite. And people are living out the wrong data. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great summary. That's a great summary, Dr. B. And we're going to talk too the, much. You, you push my button on this. I'm so passionate. I hope I wasn't obnoxious. Yeah, I that's why I brought you on was here. Okay? I, I just okay. want all of your info. This is what I wanted. Absolutely. No, and I'm going to put breaks the link. my heart. I wouldn't be who I am today if I didn't have the guts to go on horror. Even my functional <laughs> friends 20 some years ago said, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And um, it was it was a courageous act. And I I see what happens to women and I don't want this to happen to my sisters. I want yeah. to help more people get access to quality, science-based, well-done hormone care. Yes, 100%. No, you're you're my hero. You're my guiding light. I, I you know, I mean, I just I, I want to follow in your footsteps with aging the way you look, the way you sound, your, the, your brain function. I mean, it's just absolutely unbelievable. And you have just been a shining light in the functional community. As you said, more, I believe that more functional docs need this training because you, you probably see this too. There's still some of them that they're using the integrative and the functional terms, but they got one foot back here in conventional medicine that we just got to pull them over and just say, you know, get, get rid of the fear, get rid of the old way of thinking and come into this research that we have available for you, that we, we can show you how this works, but we need to kind of pull them out of that conventional way. And just one other comment with that. The, the thought is, is you have this estrogen window. If you don't initiate hormones within five years or perhaps in 10 years, you're done. You can't do them. If you're in your 90s, you've missed your window. That's not true. You can initiate hormones at any age, but you have to do it with somebody that knows what they're doing because your receptors have been uh, sleeping for a very long time and they're mm -hmm. hyperactive when they first get woken up. And there's other, you have to do a number of things, but it's never too late to go on hormones. This whole concept of the estrogen window is inaccurate, except for one thing. If you're lucky enough to initiate hormones within a five year period of when you go into menopause, and menopause, the definition is one year without a period. So mm -hmm. after you've been 12 months without a period, you're officially. In menopause. So then the next five year period, if you go on hormones, even for five, six months, you protect the, the benefit of that time is the most far reaching. Okay. And you protect a part of your brain that is vulnerable to stroke in your se late 70s and 80s. And stroke is what we're all frightened to. I'm frightened to bejesus of getting a stroke. I don't yep. want a stroke. Right. And the drug my mother was given when she was pregnant with me makes me battle that on other ways because I'm born with kind of a lemon body that I've done everything to try and make lemonade out of. But um, so realize, don't miss out on that window if you can, even if you don't want to be on hormones long term, there are so benefits for your bone, the three B's, your bones, your breasts, your brain, mm -hmm. amazing benefits if you start within five years, but you can start at any time. But if you ask the majority of your doctors and say, I'm in my 80s, I'm in my 90s, can I start? They are going to tell you no. And that is not accurate. David Brownstein, I'm going to go hang out with him and his wife at their lake in two weeks. His first introduction into hormones was his dad, who was on multiple meds and one foot in the grave. And he was in his mid 80s. He initiated him on testosterone and gave him another 10, 12 years of great life. 
Mm -hmm. Our bias against much of hormone care is wrong. Yeah. And the problem is the majority of doctors you ask, even though they're well-intentioned and they want to do you a good job, the majority of their information on this topic Mm -hmm. is unfortunately inaccurate. It is. And that's why I want to thank you, Dr. Amy, for letting me come on because it means the world to me to share this information. This is decades in the gathering and then in the living and now with platforms like yours in the sharing. Well, thank so you. Thank you. Uh, back at you. Thank you. I, I, I love you to death, Dr. B. I, I just, I can't thank you enough for your time and your knowledge and all the research that you've done. I mean, it, it takes someone like you to dive into this and to break it down for people and to get the message out. So are you coming out with a podcast again? Are you yes, coming yes, back yes, to Yes, 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 I am. I'll tell okay. you what happened is so, you know, I'm going to be 74 in this last year, every month I've been lecturing in five or six cities and I've been working a week in Florida in some months, two or three months, I've worked two weeks in Florida. So I'd be Florida for a week, then fly to Charlotte, then go back home and have my own practice, then fly to Minnesota. And some of these lectures are eight and a half and nine and a half hours a day where I'm the only speaker Oh, and then go to yeah. San Francisco, then go back to Florida. I was, I just couldn't do it. And I was so un, unsettled by what's shown up in America. What I've been seeing is I've been flying around the country. Yeah. How I saw the pandemic didn't bring the best out of many of us, but perhaps yeah. the worst. So I got unsettled as to what I wanted my message to be. In the, and I got censored. I had the Frontline COVID Care yep. Alliance docs on. So I got a number of my shows removed on YouTube. And then when Malone came on Rogan's show, I had a number yep. of my shows removed on Spotify. And each of those shows was amazing and took so many hours of work. So I was like, okay, as my grandmother would say, Gnug, I'm going to step back, but I'm relaunching my podcast very soon in a new form, okay. in a new way. I'm kind of debating the title of it, but I'm coming out again. I miss it very much. Good. But that's what happened is I, I just, uh, so every Sunday I come home when, when I'm not lecturing and I canoe for seven miles yesterday, I canoed for three hours with two girlfriends. I must admit, I came home and spent the rest of the day in bed. It was, it was so much breeze and the waves were so <laughs> strong, but the, yeah. we didn't talk about exercise, but hormones help keep you exercising, which then helps you keep responding to the hormones. Yep. It's a fabric, a tapestry. But anyway, I will have my podcast back. Thank you for missing it. I appreciate that. Oh, I do. I do miss it. I just listened to the old episodes. So at least those are still out. But no, we're going we're gonna to put your links to the supplements, to your books, to everything in the show notes for sure. So people can reach out to you and follow you and, and read read her books get the knowledge that she's speaking about we can only go over so much in an hour so dive into dr b's podcast even though they're on you know they you can still find them on all podcasts. right and my website is drlindsayburkson.com and all the podcasts are there but they're on spotify and apple play and amazon yep. music has now invited me to be on there so i'm going to be on amazon music soon so it's going to be really cool Very but nice. i just you know it's hard to know the world needs heroes and heroines and you yep. can't trust almost anybody anymore. So many of our experts have such financial ties. So yeah. what do you say with all that, this, that you're just not adding to the cacophony and the division and the yelling? I mean, I just didn't want to add to the cacophony. I don't even know if I'm saying that word right. I'm always having a hard time with that one word pronunciation. With the, the, the roar, I wasn't yeah. sure how to help settle and heal us. I'm a healer. You're a healer. How to do that without they're all wrong. We're all right. You know, it's so hard to, to avoid that stance, but that stance isn't going to unite us once again, how to do all of this and stay like the family, the community that we could possibly be. Cause right now, part of our illness as a country is our division. Mission. Mm -hmm. Thinking about this a lot. I'm not sure if I'll be able to hit it on the head, but that'll be one thing I'll be trying to do with the podcast is to give information, but less divisiveness. Beautiful. That's beautiful. Well, thank you, Dr. B. I, I, I would love to bring you back on whenever whenever you want to come on. We can continue this conversation. <laughs> so thank you so much for being here. I greatly appreciate it. You're so gorgeous inside and out. Thank you very much. Blessings. <laughs>